Attention, please. Thank you for attending. We're going to call this meeting of the Senate Public Safety Committee to order. Would like to ask our very own Senator Kim Jackson to open us up in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather together to make laws for your citizens who work and play here in Georgia. We pray especially for those men and women, those people who serve in uniform across this great state. We ask that you would bless them, that you would protect them, and that you would continue to give them the courage that they need in order to care well for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we've got several bills on the calendar today. We're going to begin with our very own rules chairman, Senator Mullis, and we'll begin with Senate Bill 259, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and I haven't been in this uh, room since we've renovated somewhat, so it uh, speaks a little louder, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, 259, thank you, brought to me by the, uh, 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 hold it. <laughs> Formerly Georgia Carey. What is it now? GA 2A. GA 2A. GA 2A. And this is uh, uh, regarding uh, guns. And let, let me talk about sec uh, the Section 1. It strengthens uh, prohibition against creating databases on we weapons carry because we don't think this information it should be transferable. Then it becomes a registry. A registry. And we don't want that. Um, also, there are have been instances of different agencies within the same county saying that they are same jurisdictional, so it would be okay to give them the same data. And, and that is rare, but that shouldn't happen either. The language clears up the confusion of stating that the prohibition on multiple multi-jurisdictional list, including sharing between agencies and department. That would be forbidden. It also institutes a small uh, damage claim for a party who has to sue to stop an agency from breaking law, meaning if they have to sue for that, then uh, their uh, legal fees would be reinstituted. Huh? Pretty close. Okay. The purpose of this claim is to allow court proceedings to go forward even if the agency stops sharing its data based on the, that the judge can issue an order. In the past, these cases have been thrown out once the agency stops sharing the, the database, but we don't want this to happen anymore. We think their information should be private. Um, also, in section two, be glad to answer any questions if anybody has some, Mr. Chair, to your discretion. Well, As we thank go. you, thank you, Chairman Mullis, and, and maybe even Mr. Lofton can answer this question for yes, us. Sir. Do you have any uh, examples of how that was done in the past and may have been Mr. shared? Mr. Lawson has that answer. In fact, that's why I brought him to make sure he could answer all those simple questions, and I'd be more for the tough ones. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Probably the most famous case occurred down in southwest Georgia, I believe, it was in the Albany area, where a student. Uh, who was at the uh, Kennesaw State University had applied for a license uh, and he was on a uh, on a database um, and uh, later uh, later on say a year or two later a, uh, a young lady I think had been uh, stalked or perhaps attacked by a gentleman of the same name and so one agency within that county content you know did a search uh, 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 we believe illegally got the database um, for the weapons license carry holders, and then he was uh, arrested at Kennesaw State University, even though he was nowhere near uh, the, the the scene of the crime or, or at any point uh, therein. And he uh, he was taken back uh, to Albany, arrested. He was uh, held in confinement, um, and if his family had not gotten directly involved, uh, he he would have he would have been uh, tried, and you know hopefully found not guilty, but it, it was absolutely a case of mistaken identity. And the only reason uh, that he was apprehended was because of uh, his name appearing on the weapons carry license database from an application uh, that he had made. The, the agency should not have shared 
his name with the other agency that was doing the investigation. That, that's the most recent and the most egregious example. So again, it's, it's not something that's occurring, uh, we hope, every day. Uh, it, it possibly could. Um, but what this language will do w is ensure that the law is crystal clear that even within a county, even within the same jurisdiction, that the sharing of these databases is, is not acceptable. And if I could, I think if I would draw two uh, parallels to that. The first one is uh, today we believe in data privacy for everyone, right? We don't want to share information. We don't want big tech to share information, and we don't want government to share information. But I think in addition, uh, it's very consistent with going through a court of law where you can't arbitrarily find other things in order to connect those dots. It has to be germane to the case that it's at hand. If that's not accurate, please, please tell me. That, that's, that's exactly correct, Chairman. That there's been a, uh, there's a, a long history of, of uh, this, t this sort of thing being uh, illegal uh, against the law. That's, that's, a, that's a critical piece. I have a question from uh, Chairman Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if, if, I, if I'm understanding you correct, these databases are kept and maintained within the county where the application is made. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's correct. Within the agency. That the, uh, within the agency. When you say agency, are we talking about within the probate court? Uh, if the probate court is doing its own fingerprinting and background checking there. Or the jurisdiction it, If not, it may be the sheriff's office. Right. So, so this information is on a standalone database, so it's no part of uh, GCIC or anything like that where it could be accessed by any other agency within the state of Georgia? It should not be. That is correct. Okay, so it, it should not be a part of GCIC or any of those other statewide networks. It should be a standalone network in 159 counties. That is correct, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Did you have a question? Okay. Uh, Senator Jackson? Uh, so, pardon my ignorance here, but can you help me understand why we don't want to have a database? So, for instance, I have a license to drive a vehicle, and that's I, presumably a database where you can find that license that I have to drive a vehicle. Uh, in my experience, a car is equally uh, deadly. It, maybe even a gun might even be more deadly than a car. Uh, so, help me understand why we wouldn't want to have a database of who's licensed to carry. So with it being a constitutional right, uh, the, the, the fact that, that citizens have the ability, uh, and not just have the ability, they have the right uh, to carry a gun and to carry one uh, uh, concealed if, you know, if they choose, the, uh, the fact that they have a license, that they have to have a license currently to exercise that right should not then put them as a law-abiding citizen on a, on a, regist on a registry. So, Having a registry of gun owners is something that the Second Amendment community has always been deeply opposed to. Uh, that, that the fact that you've chosen to exercise your constitutional right would then put you on a database of, uh, you know, on, on a par with, as you know, some of these some of these other registries of convicted uh, uh, offenders, essentially. And just one follow-up question. Of course, yes. uh, so the example that you gave, you talked about a, a woman who was a victim of stalking, went to the authorities and was seeking some type of perfection, pr protection. They found somebody who was assumably a, a gun owner, uh, a gun carrier, who may have been a threat to her. And so they went to find that person. Mistaken identity, all that aside, uh, what would you recommend to protect future victims of stalking um, when it comes to um, knowing whether or not the person who's stalking them has a gun or not. What protections can we assure for those, those women? So I, I think we have some very strong uh, anti-stalking laws uh, on the books now, but just because somebody carries a gun, that does, not, that, that does not make them a threat. More than likely, the people who have a weapons license are the law-abiding citizens. It's, it's the, it's the Criminal offenders. It's the, it's the criminals that, that aren't obeying the law, that are carrying illegally, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So, I'd Senator Robertson? A point of clarification, what, what, if I'm reading this correct, Mr. Chairman, you're not trying to prevent a county from having a database. What you're trying to prevent is multiple counties creating a multi-jurisdictional database where they're sharing across yeah. jurisdictional lines. If, 
if Muskogee County, where probate court handles it, or, or Harris County, they can have their individual databases. That would and kind of be a open records of you in court, and that would be reasonable. We don't want them to share that information. Correct. Using, using it basically agencies. for fishing expeditions should, like you said, somebody outside the jurisdiction was given information from this other database, and because of uh, this individual had only applied for a license, and because this individual had the same name of the alleged stalker, Pardon. he got caught up in this web of confusion and ended up in a, in a jail. That is correct. All right. But all you're talking about is if there wants to be 159 databases, there can be, but there can't be one database, including you know, multiple jurisdictions, correct? That's correct, and, and to, to go a little further on that, that, that one database within that county should only, should only be for the purposes of the weapon license application. It, sh it should not be allowed for a fishing expedition either, even within that county. That's correct. Yes, yes sir. Let's go to section two if we could, General. All right, thank you. And, and look, I used to be, a long time ago, a, a zoning administrator. I was a mm -hmm. member of GAZA. They're an association for everything. That's Georgia Association of Zoning Administrators. And section two deals with um, zoning issues and not targeting gun sites or gun ranges or whatever that any a proper no, noise ordinance would be efficient as long as it's not to target a law-abiding citizen with a weapon. And also uh, when it comes to acres of 10 acres or larger that they, um, they can't be banning discharging a firearm in that, f f f that locality. Now, we don't expect this to be going on in subdivisions and places where houses are close by no means. But if you have 10 acres or larger, then we expect some uh, uh, notification about that and we think that that should be legal. Okay, I got a couple questions on that one. I think Senator Summers, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Friend, um, I take exception with number two for the simple reason, you know, in South Georgia, um, you, you, we're very rural in South Georgia, and I have a subdivision that I developed, it's 200 acre subdivision, that all the houses are either in three or five acre tracks. You either have a house on a three acre track or five acre track. They shoot regularly in their <laughs> backyard. I mean, they shoot 22, sometimes you sight in rifles and whatever. I would want that lowered down. I wouldn't want a, a tenant acre to be in there to cause that kind of issue. Yes, so thank you. That's a great question, Senator Summers. And the uh, what the, le the legislation does not say you have to have right, 10 acres. Right, I know, but it's. it's what, what it does is, is it says that if, a, if, you have t if you have 10 acres or more, then the county can't just e exclude you from being able uh, to, shoot, to you know, construct a fire range. And where you live example. and where I live, that won't happen. Well, I promise you, if you don't, Mr. Chairman, I mean, don't get me wrong, I mean, around our house and around South Georgia, I mean, you're here shooting every day. Yes, sir. I mean, it's it's every day, and it's, uh, you know, they're not they're not killing anybody. They're having a good time. They're, they're just tightening their guns. They're doing their thing. I just feel like that it would give They're it. target practicing. They're making sure their exactly. ability is Exactly, uh, and I will in. say this with all due respect. I mean, you know, right now all the sheriffs that I know are wonderful guys, but, you know, you could get somebody come in there and say, well, you live on uh, nine acres, and you can't shoot your gun anymore. I, I'm just saying it. That is the way it's written. It seems like to me that's a possibility. Sen Senator, I, I just want to uh, provide some clarity, if I could. Uh, I think you're reading that um, in, in a different way. So this is just saying that the, the county can't come in if they say you can't have, you can't shoot a firearm off in this entire county. If somebody has a parcel of land of 10 acres or more, then they're saying, well, no, actually, we have the the option oh, to do that. Oh, 10 acres, I understand. I'm right. talking less. That's what I was getting right. at. Right, you're, you're fine in that. This, this no way impacts, I think, your specific scenario. And so so if, if you have five acres of land or, or right. less and the county has not specifically That's what I'm getting at. zoned against that, so right now they can, they can do whatever zoning they want. And uh, what, what we see happening is you have- Is there a zoning for shooting guns, Mr. Chairman? So what, what they'll do is, is not necessarily for- a, it, this doesn't apply so much to private individuals as it does to those who have, say, a commercial outdoor uh, firing range. They've, they've created a firing range and they open it up and, and people, you know, come and pay money to be able to shoot there in a safe manner. And so uh, sometimes what you'll get is, is neighborhoods that will move in, you know, developers will, will create a neighborhood and then people move in and they'll discover, oh, that's a, there's a firing range. I don't, I don't want to hear that noise. I don't want to hear the shots. 
you know, five times a day or whatever it may be. And so they'll convince the county to then zone firing ranges to where they can only be in, say, in industrial areas. And, you know, in some of these counties, the industrial areas, the, you know, there's, there's, there's it's a very small percentage of the acreage, and it's not where that individual may already have their firing range in place. And so what we're saying is if you have, if you have 10 acres, they can't basically zone your firing range out of existence. However, everything else that would normally apply, say, for example, a noise restriction that's applied universally, so it's not just firearms, it's fireworks, it's any, any noise, you know, uh, having a band on your property, that sort of thing, anything that's applied generally would still apply. Uh, this, is, this is just making sure that, that firing ranges aren't specifically excluded in the law or in, in, in through zone. So I, I think, I, I, I appreciate your question. We appreciate where you're coming from. I, I don't think this hurts your people in that way. That's my opinion. I think you're good. I mean, I think it'll help your, I agree. Uh, protect you. Senator Jackson. Yes, uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you said you've been on zoning, so you're familiar with the term setback, right? Yes. A setback. So, so in DeKalb County, where I live, the setback for where you can have a chicken coop, bear with me here. Don't have the chicken coops in I, DeKalb County? You know, I have 35 chickens, sir. Oh, oh right. okay. I'm, so, I'm so, sorry. I meant chicken houses. Different. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so listen, <laughs> the, the setback for a chicken coop is determined uh, not by property lines, but by how far you are away from your neighbor's house from a building so a chicken coop has to be 50 feet from any building um, so the setback essentially says that if your neighbor's house is 50 feet away then they probably can't smell it and it's fine um, I think what this law though would do what it would not it doesn't provide for any setbacks so what you're saying to me is uh, Fernando if you can stand up so I have I have about I have five acres of land but my neighbor's house is where he is from my house. With this law, you're telling me that I can discharge if I had 10 acres, even though our houses are this close to each other, you're saying that it would be acceptable to dis discharge a firearm and that my county could not put any setbacks in place. Not at five acres. At if I had acres. 10, but they, yeah. I mean, even with 10, they, our houses would still be proximate to each other. And you're saying that my county cannot provide any setbacks restricting how close I can be to my neighbor's you know, property. Man, if you'd like to report, please. You can sit down. Thank you much, uh, Senator Jackson. I understand your question, where you're coming from. The, so th this does not, this does, this does not give the property owner permission to abandon all responsibility to his or her neighbors. Right, so you still have a responsibility as a gun owner operating a gun to shoot safely. You have a responsibility to know where that bullet's going. You have a responsibility to make sure that that uh, uh, you know that you're operating your firearm in a safe manner, uh, whether you're 50 feet from your neighbor's house or 500 yards from your neighbor's house. If if you're shooting anywhere close to that neighbor's house, that. that there's, you know, you would I, have the right to call the they, police that they're being unsafe. If, if, if people but are if operating I, their firearms in an unsafe manner, this, uh -huh. this legislation does, does not offer them any protection whatsoever uh, sure. that they don't currently have. Sure, but, but this law would enable me, I'm saying, to, to, so I can shoot safely. I'm very well trained. Mm -hmm. So you're, this law, though, would enable me to stand on the edge of my property next door to my neighbor and to discharge my, fire, what, my firearm as long as I have my 10 acres as and, long as you and, and it it's safely. safe and, and so I'm handling it safely I'm not shooting towards their house so I can be right up on their property right up on their house and discharge a firearm well I don't legally. know that would be safely right there I think the law enforcement would have the uh, what's the word I'm looking for Randy when you have uh, you're able to discretion, discretion. yes thank you and if it, they're unsafe or not yeah and then one, can I just ask one final question? Please. So, Mr. Chairman, I know you're familiar with the term of home rule. I think Republicans actually taught me what home rule was. Are you serious? I'm 100% I'm sure y'all are ones who taught well, me. Sometimes home rule goes a little too far when they invade state laws and other things like that. I mean, we, we have a right to make sure we have an overall law and then from there, local jurisdictions can govern within that perimeter. And how did you come up with 10 acres? 
Because uh, 10 city acres ain't the same as 10 well, country acres. I doubt acres. that that happens right here. In Chickamauga, that would happen. Just so thank for, you so ju much. Just for clarification, I'm pretty sure 10 acres is equal distance in both the city and the country. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let's uh, continue on the section, section uh, three. Three, please. And uh, just for time's sake, we are uh, 22 minutes into our one hour, and there are four more bills, and people okay. want to speak. I'll do it quick. Well, the, the third one is a little simpler. It's about uh, seized firearms. <laughs> I thought Fran Millar was back. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he can't whisper. I love him though. Well, anyway, this uh, this simply requires that after 12 months they have to have auction for the firearms, and they do have to have be um, uh, required background checks because you're having weapons that were used in crime, criminal activities. So, but we're just trying to push them out and get them off the uh, out of the uh, property evidence, and uh, we're giving them a year to do it, and not for dealers, for the general public. Questions? Yeah, that's all I got right there. All right, Senator Jackson. Uh, Is that a bad thing too? So I, I just <laughs> I want to understand uh, clearly here. What you're saying is that any gun that is seized, say in the city of Atlanta, for example, um, is seized for for crime or evidence after it's been processed and all those things. That the jurisdiction has a year, mm -hmm. and then they have to by law sell those guns back to people. Is that what this says? Yes, yes. Okay, and so I just wanna, I think this might be bad for business is really kind of my point here. We okay. have 74 gun manufacturers in Georgia who make new guns that haven't been used for crimes. Um, they are perfectly good guns, 74 businesses. So why are we spending our time creating a law forcing us to recycle old guns well, some of the old guns are nostalgic or uh, maybe antiquish or uh, sought after type gun. Uh, some, as you know, now the seller's market is hard to get everything. You've been on a grocery store. I mean, not that there are guns on the grocery store shelf, <laughs> but yet. there are a lot of things missing. So there's some people that have that desire for my, my uncle, who's 92 years old, the mayor of Chickamauga was a gun collector and he would have been interested in this. He's too old right now, but bless his heart, you good man. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, um, I know currently, and not all of these weapons are necessarily weapons used in crime. Right? Thank Some you. of them are weapons recovered on search warrants related to burglaries and other things, and that basically they're left unclaimed after a certain period of time. And those that are found it's to be. part of the um, case, would it be a. Those that are found to be. Uh, it be an assault until, mm -hmm. until the case was resolved. And those that are found to be unsafe weapons and things of that nature, they're actually turned over to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for destruction. Thank you. Uh, and I noticed, I think, some language in there where you sent some testing and some research yeah. and other things. But um, also, when we, when we talk about supply and demand, the opportunity of auctioning and putting weapons back on the street actually, in some cases, uh, will uh, allow our gun manufacturers to actually need to manufacture less weapons because we are putting some high-end weapons, whether it's a, a Browning shotgun or a, or a Glock 45. And, and again, not every one of these weapons are used in the commission of a crime. Right. Is that right? Yeah, thank you, absolutely. And let, let me also say, the ones that are involved in crime will still be able to hold through the case Cases are taken care of. Right. This this is only uh, weapons held in property evidence once the case has been disposed of, correct? So yes, and this would help keep uh, from new guns being made. Which is bad for business. All right. Uh, I'm teasing. Let's, let's I'm teasing. Order. Excuse me. Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman, does all guns have to be sold at the auction, or could a county well, or a sheriff it, it, department, if they saw some gun uh, th there were some guns that they could use well they're deciding which ones are being auctioned if they're going to put them back in use i'm sure that'd be okay okay uh, i'm going to stop and ask for some committee decorum if you are not recognized please take your conversations outside thank you okay we're going to continue on are there any other questions to chairman mollis or mr lawton 
Okay. We've got two people signed up to talk about this bill. Are you wanting to be heard? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if you are, I'm going to ask you to keep your comments brief, please. All right. First person up, Mr. Weaver, come on up. And then Louis uh, Estrada, you will be on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me to speak. Members of the Senate Public Safety Committee, I rise in approbation of the legislative uh, efforts under Senate Bill 259, sponsored by Chairman Mullis. And if I was where you were, I would certainly vote the right way. But having said that, um, regardless of the concerns that have been raised under Sections 1 and 3, I would like to focus on Section 2 of the bill. If it should meet with the committee's approval, I would invite the committee to please consider on lines 31 through 34. Uh, that's current law. It just creates the exception for paragraph two. I would ask that the committee please consider the addition of six words at the end of line 34 after the word county, except when done in self-defense. Regardless of whether or not you live in Walker County or Harris County or Fulton County or Crisp County, if a person shoots a gun and, and it's done in self-defense, no local ordinance should apply to that. And I would ask that the committee grant leave to consider whether or not that should be put in the bill just as a matter of law and principle and then my second point that i was going to raise just very briefly in approbation of what senator cardin summers had said regarding the 10 acre rule i understand what the author's intent is and i understand what this gentleman explained to the committee but i do think that it's noteworthy consideration maybe the 10 acre earmark is maybe too large maybe five acres would be something that would have stopped cities and counties or maybe not but that would be a public policy decision but at the least i would respectfully request that this committee grant leave to consider the addition of those six words at the end of line 34 making it clear that if you are a law-abiding citizen and you legally shoot someone when lawfully done in self-defense if that's the result of that case then that local city or county ordinance that prohibits or limits the discharge of the firearm cannot apply in that particular situation. Thank you, Mr. Reaver. Appreciate your time. Lewis, would you please come up? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for the opportunity to come and uh, speak to you in support of SB 259. My name is Luis Estrada, and I am member of the Board of Directors of Georgia Second Amendment, formerly known as GeorgiaCarry.org. We strongly support this bill, and we think that it is a, in the best interest of Second Amendment uh, restoration to start adopting this kind of uh, laws into our books. I particularly come from an area of the world where there is very little opportunity for a common citizen to have guns. And particularly with the gun registration, we have seen some very bad examples there, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, and others, uh, where this creation of databases had led to incredible crimes in the part of corrupted governments. So personally, myself, I have seen this, and I have experienced this in my own skin. So I know it's not a very good policy to start creating a database. It can be used. We have some good governments in the US, but you, you don't have a warranty that that's going to be the case forever. So I strongly encourage you to continue with this bill and put it on our books. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, will you come back up here? Do you have any final comments? No, sir. Oh, yeah, tough, <laughs> tough committee. Uh, uh, yeah, this will be quick. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, let me tell you this. Uh, I was sitting here long ago when Judge Barnes was shot and killed by a uh, man being seen. You were here, too. As I ate, ate something in the morning, and we, we didn't know what was going on, but we knew it was bad. 
And since then, we have allowed court officials to carry a firearm if they choose. And we wanted to, you see the list down there, district attorneys, investigators employed by and assigned to by district attorney's office, assistant district attorneys, uh, 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 attorneys, investigators employed by the prosecuting attorney council, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there. And uh, we would, uh, I think I need a counselor. I need to add the uh, uh, solicit, solicit, solicit general for state courts or for anything. So can you add that one? Is that it there? Okay. Well, please do, and that's all I have. We're just adding somebody else to that list. And thank you for bringing this forward. This is pretty straightforward because these folks already are licensed and carry in That's all right. other fashions as uh, someone who participates in either law enforcement or the criminal justice system. While we uh, clarify that uh, with legislative counsel, does anybody have any questions for Chairman Mullis? Uh, I'm surprised to see Senator Jackson. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman. I hope this means my bill still can get the rules one I day. I think the world of you. I want you to give me a fair assessment of any bill I bring forward to you. All right. Provided so you want your bills. I, I do. <laughs> can you, how, how does the. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. How would the, how would the um, enforcement process work for this? So, um, Well, given, they'd have to go through the screening of a courtroom and then the police officer there would know who they are and make sure that they're the right person with that. I mean. I'm sure in Floyd, mm -hmm. Fulton County, DeKalb County is so much bigger. Mm -hmm. But in Chattooga County, where my solicitor general would like to have his firearm, that we all know each other. But he still has to go through the proper devices, entering a courtroom like everybody else does. Thank you. Okay. We have confirmed that they are covered. Thank uh, you. Okay. Yep. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay, any other questions? We've got, uh, this is Senate Bill 277. Nobody has signed up to speak, I don't believe. What is the will of the committee? I'll make a motion to be uh, Senator Payne got you first. Would you like to second Senator Anderson? I'll All right. <laughs> if any further discussion, seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> all those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, it's five to two. Congratulations hey, thank you. again. And best of wishes and rules. Mr. Thank Chairman. you. And Mr. Chairman, let me know how I can be of service to you and your committee members in my little old committee. We certainly will. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next one, uh, we've got uh, our own uh, Senator Robertson right here. He's going to uh, talk to us about Senate Bill 245. And what I do want to mention in this bill is if we do decide to take action on it today, we will have to correct the date to be 2022. I'll turn it over to you, Senator Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and that date, I do appreciate you catching that and, and giving this the opportunity to marinate for 12 months uh, to, to, to allow us to contemplate it. Basically, what this does, uh, is it's simple. Basically, it prohibits the enforcement of any federal edict contrary to the right to bear arms under Georgia Constitution. So basically it's states' rights and prevents the federal government from coming in trying to impede upon the constitutional right here in Georgia and the laws here in Georgia that, uh, that, that are associated with the uh, possession of a uh, firearm uh, here in the state of Georgia. And I'll stand for any questions. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Senator Jackson, is there a question? Well, I didn't, you haven't pressed your button yet. I was, I was just assuming one was coming, but he go right ahead. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Senator Robertson, can you give us a, an example of a state uh, of a federal law that might contradict our constitutional right as under the Georgia Constitution to bear arms? Do you mean give you, give you an example of one that currently exists? Yes, of one that currently yeah. exists. Be there, 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 there's not one that currently exists. My primary concern is the um, the tidal wave of executive orders that seem to come out and seems to be the way to legislate out of our U.S. Capitol now. This is to prevent um, overly aggressive political activists who may hold federal office, i.e. the presidency, whether they be Republican or Democrat, to be able to pass executive orders that would require or ask um, state law enforcement agencies to direct their personnel to seize, possess, or take away uh, firearms that are legally owned by Georgia citizens under Georgia law. 
May I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Uh, so are you aware that in other states where this has been enacted, it is it has resulted in local law enforcement no longer participating collaboratively with federal agencies like, say, the DEA? Yes, I am aware of that. And is this something that you would hope for in our great state, that our local agencies would no longer cooperate with federal agencies? Uh, every federal agency I've worked with, and I think I've worked with probably the entire group of Alphabet Soup, um, has never attempted to infringe upon the state rights of Georgia. So I have no concern about a federal agency coming into the state of Georgia trying to take over and, and violate uh, jurisdictional guidelines. And one final question. Uh, so why are we um, why are we criminalizing our local law enforcement who are simply interpreting the law as they know it and uh, instructing their their subordinates to follow the law I mean you're, you're saying under a second second violation it would result in a misdemeanor so you're you're criminalizing say the the captain of the police agency who says yeah no I want you to actually go ahead and do this work with uh, you know with this federal agency no that's not what I'm saying at all a federal agency can't come into the Georgia when there's not a federal violation of law and go into anybody's property and seize anything the federal government does not have jurisdiction in in anyone's home unless a federal law is being violated uh, this right here obtains obtains and it would probably be above the rank of captain it would be a chief or a sheriff that directed their personnel to go in and take a firearm, a legally owned and legally possessed firearm from a Georgia citizen based on, again, political activism that may come out of our, uh, our, our great U.S. Capitol. And if anything, this protects those agencies from having to carry out um, basically uh, executive orders, not even laws, if you will. Uh, so I see it more as a protection of local and state law enforcement as opposed to criminalizing uh, any actions carried out by those great agencies. Question from Senator Summers. Chairman Robinson, if I understand correctly, it's basically strengthened the Second Amendment for Georgia. Yes, sir. It's, it's not only does it strengthen it, but it clarifies the judicial, the jurisdictional lines between the federal government and the state government. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there that the federal government has free reign within our state, federal law enforcement. Let me let me put it that way. And my friends involved in law enforcement understand the the jurisdictional lines that it starts with the local police department sheriff's office and moves up the chain for the assistance from our state agencies which you had a prime example of that during the summer of 2020 when uh, surrounding areas refused to come into the city of atlanta and back them up during the riots that's when you saw the governor bring the Georgia State Patrol, the GBI, the DNR, Georgia Department of Corrections, those states and those agencies in here, which under normal circumstances would be managing the recess, uh, protecting the assets and resources of the state while the locals protected their own. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. Senator Jackson. So, Senator Robinson, I just want to be clear. So, you're saying that if Congress, uh, in the federal government, if Congress passes a law that you understand to be contradictory to our Constitution that gives us the right to bear arms here in Georgia, that you would, this bill would authorize any law enforcement personnel in this state of Georgia to tell their officers, do not follow this edict from on high. In other words, this bill would allow law enforcement agencies and officers in Georgia to tell officers, do not do your job that the Congress has designated for you to do. And, and if we, if we want to play hypothetical, I'll play hypothetical. If the federal government passes a law that violates the Georgia Constitution, our great Attorney General Chris Carr would immediately sue the federal government and the law would not be carried out. This right here is to protect uh, police chiefs and sheriffs and those who work for them and other law enforcement agency heads from enforcing a federal law that is in violation of the Georgia Constitution when it comes to the right to bear arms. 
Okay, we've got one person signed up for this bill. Uh, Mr. Weaver again. Thank you for recognizing and speak on second occasion, Chairman Albers. Uh, members, I, I, if it should meet with your approval, I would ask that the term agency or political subdivision be slightly broadened. Uh, there are two groups of political subdivisions that I feel that may leverage merit to be added in here. I know that the committee is going to have to make a technical change to the date of 21 to 22, but for agency and political subdivision, it omits reference to the words board and then school district. If it should meet with the committee's approval, I would respectfully request that this committee please consider uh, adding the word board after the word department on line 14 and then line 15 after the word municipality, add the word school district because boards are appointed and school districts, those school boards are elected. My fear is if you fail to do that, even though a department or a school district themselves might be banned, the governing board wouldn't be covered. And not just for schools, you have the Board of Community Supervision, Board of Correction, you have Board of Public, you have all these different boards under your official code of Georgia annotated. So by including board and then on line 15 after the word municipality, including school district, you would cover those local governments and or state level governments that have those boards and or school districts, whether they're city or countywide or statewide. Please. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Appreciate your time. That is all we have signed up uh, to speak today. Uh, Senator Robertson, are there any further comments you'd like to make on your bill? No, sir, Mr. Chair, other than the, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present it today and just to remind you of the uh, 2022. Thank you. Well, at this time, I would uh, open it up to the committee's will for an amendment. All right, uh, Senator Carton Summers, uh, is your amendment uh, on line 21, changing it from July 1 to 2021 to July 1, 2022? If so, that's an excellent amendment. Thank you. Do I have a second to your amendment? <laughs> We've got a second from Senator Robertson. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All opposed? Okay, five to zero. Okay, and we have a new committee substitute as amended now. What is the will of the committee? Move to pass from Senator Summers, who have a second? Second. second from Senator Payne, any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, please raise your hand. All right, five to two. Congratulations, uh, Senator, best wishes and rules. All right, Senator Kirkpatrick, come on down. We have got uh, Senate Bill 358. You actually have a committee substitute in your folders today. Thank you, uh, Senator Kirkpatrick, for working uh, with Director Wigington uh, and our committee uh, to make some slight changes, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the origin of this bill was when Colonel Trish Ross, who was in charge of the Vector Center in Warner Robins, came to me uh, wanting to try to find a way to smooth the path for veterans coming out of military service to ease their way into law enforcement training. And she, of course, is now the commissioner of the Department of Veteran Services, so she's changed roles. And so we got together with our good friends at the Georgia Public Safety Training Center, and this is the end result of that conversation. Current law already authorizes, and I'm going to use Jibstick as a sh shortcut if that's okay with you, uh, to reimburse local agencies for the training of police chiefs, department heads of law enforcement units, wardens of state institutions, emergency medical personnel, and communications officers, excluding travel expenses and salaries. But this bill authorizes Jibstick to also reimburse active duty, retired, or honorably discharged members of the U.S. Armed Forces who are attending basic law enforcement training so th that we can encourage people to take that path that are coming out of the military to the extent that the General Assembly has appropriated funds. And this does not cover meals and lodging, just tuition. That's the change that was made in the substitute after getting some information. 
So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I would ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you. Well, Senator, first and foremost, let me say thank you. Uh, what a great thing to do to be helping out all those who have served us uh, in the military as our heroes, and then in a time where we're really looking for uh, uh, folks that are, are well-trained and have a great background to go into law enforcement, this couldn't be, I believe, a better partnership to do that in. So first, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I know all the great work you do on behalf of veterans uh, in our state. Uh, are there questions from the committee members? Okay, Director Wigington, I, I, I know that you are uh, in support of this bill based on our conversations. You want to add anything to this or not? Don't talk us out of it, though. Come on forward. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Thank you. Uh, currently, uh, with this bill, we have about 10 people that's uh, over the past three years that's taken advantage of what we have currently in place. They've been able to use their GI Bill as what's covered up to this point. This bill would uh, replace that where they would help continue to use their GI Bill for continuing education. So when, once you pull out of that pot, that money's gone. Uh, you can't use it again. So the way this is written, uh, there's only 10 people, average of about 10 people annually that this would apply. There's about $3,600 in tuition uh, that we can cover internally uh, if that number stays the same. Of course, we hope this number increases substantially. Uh, if it does, I will come back uh, at some point and ask for a fiscal note to, to cover those. But currently, if that number stays somewhere around it is, we're, we're okay with absorbing that in our current uh, budget. Now, there are some other fees associated with this that I, I'll address as far as application fees and requirements that's uh, required by post. Uh, as far as application, psychological things that's not covered uh, with this tuition that they would have to end up coming out of pocket for. Well, thank you, Director, and you've got my commitment to help you out in the appropriations process in order to help facilitate more folks uh, who uh, have served us in the military to hopefully assist us in the first responder ranks of Georgia. Thank yes, you. Uh, I've got a question from Senator C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and it's really not a question. I just want to move that at appropriate time we do pass. All right. Uh, do we have another question prior to that, though? Uh, Senator Robertson. I, I just want to be clear. Um, the, the individuals we're doing this for, we're not mo removing any of the disqualifiers. We're not, we're not moving any of the, for lack of a better word, obstacles that we require for the average Joe and Jane coming in off the street that, that want to go to the police academy. They still, in, in director, when you said psychological and, and the other thing, they're still subject to all the other associated costs that, that come along. Correct. All come those on. requirements would still be in place. The only thing, so currently the way you get into the academy, and I'll kind of educate you a little bit on that, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're familiar, but the rest of the committee. Uh, it was a long time ago when I got. A long time ago. <laughs> it was probably two weeks then. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, currently, if you're sponsored by an agency, uh, the way we're appropriated from you all, and thank you, uh, it covers the cost of that student coming to the academy. It doesn't cost that agency a penny other than the salary that they, they send them for and the, their meals. So the, the tuition uh, is covered by the state for that. We're already covered for that. So if they're sponsored by an agency, what we've had is we've got a small number of people that are considered pre-service. So they're not technically hired by an agency yet, so they have to pay for that out of pocket because they're not the way the, le the way the law is written, uh, we can't cover the cost of their tuition until they're working for an agency. So that's these few people that's, that's coming through the crack. They're at, and the reason they're not working for an agency is most of them are still in the military and they're on, on what's considered terminal leave. So they're in that terminal leave process uh, where they can go to the academy but they're not technically working for an agency. But we'll have people lined up at the graduation door to hire these individuals. I can assure you that. And, and, and to, to your response there, the 10 you were talking about, those are current pre-service associated with the military? That is correct. Do you have a number that, of the total pre-service numbers? Statewide? Statewide, uh, yes. for, for us, and we do about 95% 90, of the academies throughout the state right. in numbers. Uh, we end up a little bit over 100 a year. Yeah, so I, wish that, I wish that number were, were greater so we'd have a larger pool to, to compete for, well, for the talent. And I think that number's low because you've got so many agencies that have shortages, so they're hiring right. people and sending them where it's not as uh, 
it's not as competitive as it once was to get a job and be sponsored by an academy yes, because sir. of the shortages throughout the state. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other lights on. I'm gonna recognize Senator C for the purpose of a motion. Move do pass. Motion do pass, second from Senator Anderson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Passed unanimously. Congratulations and best wishes in the Rules Committee. Okay, last but certainly not least, and thank you for your patience, Senator Ginn. We've got Senate Bill 356. As I mentioned to Senator Ginn earlier today, there were a couple of people who could not get here today that asked to testify. So today will be a hearing only, and we will follow up with this bill on our committee meeting Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m. So I will turn it over to uh, the author, Senate Bill 56, Senator Ginn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Said they, uh, this bill is pretty simple. I think everybody in here knows I chair the Transportation Committee. One of the things we like to do in transportation is keep people moving and do it safely. Said, I want to start off by letting you know that I'm adamantly opposed to anybody in a moving vehicle, driving and operating a vehicle, being impaired, texting and driving, said, reading emails, doing whatever it is they're doing that would distract them from driving. Said, the, uh, the impetus of this bill is to uh, keep our traffic moving. And one of the things I want, to, I want to ask you to do for me first, if I could, I could get all of y'all to look up at me, back your chair up just a little bit, look at your knee. Look at your knee, one knee, and then tell me how many hands I'm holding up. Look at your knee and tell me how many hands I'm holding up. You cannot do it. Said they, uh, it is not possible for you to do that. And the reason that we run into so many situations where people are doing a road rage or, or, or a startled at what's going on at an intersection or whatever is because they are breaking the law. We have people every day that you can watch them at a traffic light, they pull their phone out, and because it's against the law for them to hold their phone, and they know that, they are holding their phone down there about their knee, and they are looking at their phone. They're not paying attention to what they should. Now, if you would, for me, just if you don't have a phone, you can hold your hand up. Hold your hand out in front of you, and while you're looking at me, and tell me when I raise my hand, you can see it. You can be aware of what's going on in, in, in a surrounding situation. And so for me, the, uh, there's very important things that are in this piece of legislation. You have to be at a complete and perfect stop. If you're at a complete and perfect stop, you are not the cause of an accident. You may be struck by somebody, but you will not be the cause of an accident if you are completely stopped. Clearly, said the, uh, this is a public safety uh, issue that we need to make sure that people are stopped. I don't care whether you're at a stop sign or you're at a traffic light or whatever the case may be. If we make it where somebody can hold their phone out here, they will be aware of what's going on around them. They will, they will have peripheral vision that they can see what's going on. This law is to get people from sitting there waiting at a light till somebody honks their horn, you get road rage, you get issues like that. This is, this concept is to make the Georgia driver safer. He said, the other side of it is, and I want you to think about this, I've, I've spoken with some law enforcement folks in, in, uh, since I've introduced this bill, and it seemed like it got legs last week when uh, my good friend uh, Raul said they uh, tweeted something out, and the next thing it was all over the media. But for me, one of the things that I want to try to do is if you're driving down the road and you hear your phone beep, Said they, uh, you might say, hey, I'm going to leave my phone where it is because I know there's a stop sign up here I'm coming to. I'll pick up my phone at that point and take a look at that text message or whatever the case may be. For me, I want to give people an opportunity. If you actually pulled over to the side of the road right now, said they uh, just pulled off the side of the road and looked at your phone, you'd actually be breaking the law unless your vehicle is legally parked. Now, one of the things that, that uh, we have some great research folks, and, and I will tell you, I've talked to some state patrol and some other law enforcement folks. One of the things that I don't like to copy off other people's paper, but I do know that it happens. Said the, uh, I'm an engineer and I try not to reinvent the wheel. Said the, uh, uh, Georgia law, said the, uh, uh, is one thing, I looked at Florida. Uh, if your vehicle is, is not moving in Florida, said the, uh, you're not cited for, for looking at your phone. 
said they, uh, I don't think people in Florida are running off in the ocean. I don't think it's a problem where they're, they're, they're having any more accidents and it's not something that's gonna hurt our funding. So when I start looking at this piece of legislation, it's very simple. It, it, is, it is merely one my, minor change in the law so that if your vehicle is at a complete stop, said the, uh, if I read it to you, so the, uh, uh, a full and complete stop, said the, uh, you can hold your phone. The, uh, I know this is a hearing only, and I know you have other people that you want to have, have testify on it, but I want you to think about, for me, this is something that keeps Georgia moving, keeps us in safe in a safe manner, and does something that, that uh, I, I think will improve our, our, our uh, transportation. Thank you, Senator. Uh, got a couple questions, and I think uh, some of the committee member does or do. Uh, when it comes to uh, being at a stop sign, very different than I believe a stop light. All right, a stop light, you're actually there and you're waiting some time. With a stop sign, you're you're almost continuously moving because you're stop go, stop go. If you are at a stop sign, you're literally usually one of the next people going. Or if you're in a line of a few cars, it, it's an immediate go. To me, there's a, a distinguishing between that and waiting at a traffic light, which you may be waiting 30 seconds, as an example. Until I'll invite happens. you to Danielsville, Georgia. Said our stop signs, you can be there all by yourself. <laughs> I, I have no doubt, but in uh, Senator Jackson's uh, DeKalb County, uh, you'll be there with a few friends. Yeah. The next thing uh, that I think that we talked about when the original legislation was passed by Representative Carson a couple of years ago uh, was twofold. One was cradling your device. Uh, and most folks, uh, myself included, cradle my device like you had where your hand was in an area that I could see it that would keep my line of sight. Uh, you know, that still gives people the ability to have it securely located. And then if you have to uh, take a look at it, it doesn't become a problem of, as you said, looking down at your knee. Uh, what is your uh, thought process on us using those Every vehicle is a little bit different. Said the, uh, I know that I, I use a magnetic clip on, on my vehicle, and it's and it's way out here, and and I'm apologize. Said that I can still pass a 2020 eye test, but I cannot read my phone at the distance it's on my my dash. Said the, uh, and for that, said the, uh, a lot of times I I need to, uh, and and I'll be the first to admit I have way too many contacts in my phone. I don't know what your number is, but mine's over 11,000, and so when when I try to dial voice dialing on my phone it will not work said they uh, so for me a lot of times I'll need to pull my phone off roll through hit the button and and then I can set it back up there and and uh, talk hands-free as, as I'm operating a vehicle and for me it, it's it's one of those things I had a lot of constituents that that have told me situations where they they run into problems with this and and I want to try to make sure that we're moving traffic forward we're not holding people up uh, that was, you, you preemptively talked a little bit about my last question to you, which uh, I, I always joke that I talked to my girlfriend, Siri, while in the car the whole time. Uh, I get a text message and I ask her to read it and then I respond to people verbally. Uh, I get an email in, it gets read and I respond to somebody in an email. I make phone calls that way. I even add things to my calendar all by voice and don't ever touch my telephone. W what prevents anyone from doing the similar? type of work well if, if they can do that great unfortunately some of us have a little harder time doing voice and and when you've miscommunicated in a text message and your constituent or, or your your na neighbor or your wife or if it's your girlfriend Siri said they and your wife finds out about your girlfriend Siri we're gonna have a little problem that may be true all right I've got a question from Senator Robertson Senator, um, I was curious, were you able to do any research and see the primary reason that an individual might hold their phone while sitting at a red light or a stop sign? I, I, not sure. I, you know, that's one of those things that you'd have to ask those people to do that. Yeah, well, I know a lot of research has been done on it, and a lot of times it's not necessarily to make a phone call. A lot of times it's to update their Facebook status, check their Instagram, or to send a text. And um, while, in, in course, I drive a, a pickup truck, and, and my phone I use, I have a holder that fits in my cup holder and I put my phone there and when I'm sitting at a um, at a stop sign or if I'm sitting at a red light and I need to glance over at my phone for whatever reason I can do that but my concern is and and when I'm out driving through my district normally I leave my phone in my truck because I think it's rude to glance at your phone 
um, during a meeting with a constituent or, or whatever, but I do believe that we have created a society that's dependent on this thing. And law enforcement officers are human beings. Um, we have something that we call a California roll or a California stop. It's where law enforcement officers pull individuals over who run stop signs, legitimately run them. The individual is under the complete assumption and belief, many cases, that they stopped, but they actually did not stop. Um, and so um, the concern I have about this is uh, we're setting people or law enforcement officers up for failure. I think the current law accomplishes what it needs to accomplish. I agree with the chairman as far as stop signs. Um, the stop sign, you need to be focused left and right, left and right, center, and making sure that the roads are safe and not looking at your phone for any reason. Um, and if you're looking at your phone at a red light, uh, then when the light turns green and you're still looking at your phone, it tends to increase opportunities for road rage and other issues because the horn in your vehicle is used to advise other drivers of safety issues not to alert them that they're not following, you know, not to tell them, hey, whatever you want to call them, um, the light's green, let's go. And so I'm concerned if we might create more problems by adding a, another condition to where someone could get distracted using their phone that could lead to, to many more problems and thousands of individuals in our country die each year because of being distracted by their device. So uh, the statistics I think are important and I know this is a hearing only, but I would love, if, if, if you could get those numbers, I would really love to see those. Could you help me with one thing? When you're driving your pickup truck, said the uh, if if your eye level's right here, where's your phone in a cup holder? Uh, it's adjustable. I can I can either have it low, and because I have an issue with light at night, where I can have it almost eye level. It's kind of a, a periscope type device. Okay. The uh, you know for me. Everybody drives a little bit different. Everybody's got a little different vehicle. But for me, th this is one of the things that the reason that most people are, are not paying attention is because they're worried, hey, I'm holding my phone down so nobody will see that I'm holding my phone. And for me, this is the reason why I said, look, take the shroud off of it. It's one of those things that, that for me, your vehicle's perfectly still. Said the, uh, ah, the hit your phone, set it down, drive. The, uh, and that's where, for me, I think it's one of those things that's reasonable uh, to, to expect that, you know, we have a lot of people that, that we know how many people are already. You can, you can pull up to just about any intersection you want to and stand on the side of the road and watch. And I'm sure you've probably done that in your law enforcement side well, of things. The, the fact that my truck has a lift on it, I can see into the vehicles next to me. And I see a lot of people doing exactly what you're talking about. And, and that's what I want them to stop. Because they're, those are the people that, that are, are holding up traffic. Uh, delaying the, the uh, uh, motorist out here on the road, and those are the people that, because they're they're you know, when somebody honks the horn, they're more likely to to drop what they're doing and hit the gas, and and that's not safe. And so for me, this is where the uh, having that that phone at eye level said the uh, somebody needs to do something, knock yourself out as long as you're not moving, set your phone down and drive on. Chairman, if, if you don't mind, I think we already have legislation that allows individuals to put things inside their vehicle so their phone will be at the eye level. Well, and, and that's, you know, as far as what's going on, it, it may be, but it's not happening. You see it and I see it. Yes, sir. Okay, question from Senator Jackson. Uh, just very quickly, I think that there's a drafting error in the bill. It, it becomes repetitive after line 24. Uh, so just bringing that to your attention, you don't have to answer that, but I think it may be an error. The, uh, you know, I'm not the legal scholar. I'm, I'm going to depend on my, my legal scholars to, to. What is, um, applicable to non-commercial vehicles? The under, the non-underscored the commercial vehicles because you don't want commercial drivers holders to use. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and I'll, I'll be glad to provide the, the committee. Uh, between now and, and your next meeting, the Florida statute on it. And, and uh, that might be something that I might ask Ms. Dole to, to help me with. Uh, if or, you could, uh, Senator, well, if you could send that ahead of time, we can email it out to the committee members before the meeting. The, uh, okay. Because if, they, if, they can, if those, the blue hairs in Florida can handle it, said I think we can handle it in Georgia. <laughs>
Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to ask uh, Bob Dallas to come up and uh, talk to us about this bill, and he is the only person signed up unless there's anyone else here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Bob Dallas. Just by way of background, I served as the director of the Georgia Governor's Office of Highway Safety for eight years under Governor Perdue and was involved in creating Georgia's first distracted driving law of substance in 2010. And uh, since leaving that office, of course, we know that we've upgraded Georgia's distracted driving law to make it a hands-free state. And I was actively involved with that. And I point out uh, with respect to that, that we spent a year with the study committee with uh, Representative Carson as the chair, going throughout the state, getting a lot of information from law enforcement, from the judiciary, from experts. And I'm gonna say this, we all drive, we're all experts to one degree or another, just by virtue of our being out there quite a bit. But I just wanna bring out um, a couple points which I think are very important that I think, not just this committee, but I would like to meet with the senator and talk more about. Um, one, a lot of time was spent discussing how do we enforce a distracted driving law, which is very hard to enforce. And this issue was considered, and the conclusion was, if we allowed drivers to, at a stop position, use the phone, then it'd be, hard for us to distinguish and actually get it enforced by law enforcement. And I'm not a law enforcement officer, I know Senator Robertson is, and we've talked to a lot of folks who concluded that with us. Uh, secondly, and this is very important, when we turn our attention to these phones, they do capture our attention in a very special way. And the question is, how long does it take your cognition to get back to scope what you should be looking at, which is of course the driving environment? the intersection, the things that are going on with pedestrian, cyclists, other cars that if you're looking at your phone during this time, you wouldn't otherwise see. And there are studies that talk about it that says sometimes it can take up words of 27 seconds to recapture your entire thought processes as to your driving experience. And, but it differs by person and circumstances, but I can certainly provide that study and there's several to uh, uh, the committee. Um, another point I want to make out is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, they spend a lot of time uh, looking at this and they actually give states money for this. If this were to become part of Georgia law, Georgia would not be eligible for those funds, which will be included uh, once uh, the process um, unfolds as to how it's going to be regulated, money coming from the um, infrastructure bill to the states if they meet the law's requirement. Then you can use that money to help educate people. and. Um, we have to consider this, when you all know this is, uh, in this committee, we can look at last year, 2021 and 2020, the United States and Georgia had increased traffic deaths. And our preliminary data tells us it's primarily for two reasons. One, people are speeding more. Two, people are driving distracted more. And so from our perspective, our goal is to make people drive distracted less. And don't get me wrong, the Senator's absolutely right. We see a lot of people violating this law. But if that's the case, then do we eliminate the law when we know it has a good purpose? Or do we do better at how we make the law apply to those violators? And um, I would just say that this is a, you know, it sounds like it's a common sense question, but it's really a complicated question that we're looking at here. So, you know, my now 30 plus years of doing this, um, be happy to be with the Senator and anybody else, because I think there are probably some things that we could do to help address the concerns that were raised, but I will say that as it's written right now, if I'll give you my best example. If I'm in congestion and traffic stops, I would be allowed to use my phone. I'm not sure that's what we want. So the things that we should consider in how this uh, addresses our driving behavior under the law, and once again, I close with this. Everybody's a driver, everybody's an expert, and we all have our opinions on this. Uh, Bob, thank you for your comments. Uh, if you would follow up by sending me what you mentioned about the infrastructure bill and funding, I'd like to be able to understand more of that and share it with the committee. I will. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, would you like to do a uh, wrap up here, Senator? Please. You know, I appreciate the committee's work for me. I've spent 17 years on, on a police academy board in, in a Northeast Georgia Police Academy. And for me, Having managed local governments the, uh, for 20 years before I got into the Senate, I understand the, the issues that we deal with, and I fully support our law enforcement community. I know that, that as you drive up and down the road, 
you see people texting and driving and doing those things. Those are the people that we need to pull off the roads and make them stop. I said, Nia, I want you to understand what I'm trying to do is, is move traffic safely. I said, and by doing that, I said, Nia, that, that person that's sitting at a traffic light looking at their knee, you just proved it to me a few minutes ago. You can't see me when you're looking, at your, looking down here at your phone. And for me, that's why I said, take care of it. If we can do it in Florida, by God, we can do it here in Georgia. Said they, uh, ah, you put that phone up there where you, if you need to do something and put it down and then drive. I do not want you driving distracted, and I want to make sure that, that we're safe on our Georgia highways. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, committee members. We will meet again this Thursday at 1 p.m., same room. Have a great day. This meeting is hereby adjourned.